Welcome to the Social Lights podcast with Kate Vandervoort, where I interview changemakers and innovators on how they connect with their tribe on social media. Brought to you by Social Mediology. Welcome to today's episode of the Social Lights podcast. I am here today with Paul Zelizer, who is one of the first business coaches to focus on the needs of social entrepreneurs and social impact businesses, and is the founder of Awarepreneurs, a top social entrepreneur podcast and online community. Paul has helped hundreds achieve their impact and financial goals whilst learning to create an enjoyable life. He's the former director of social media for Wisdom 2.0, one of the premier conscious business brands in the world. In that role, he helped create and implement strategies that grew the conference from 650 attendees to over 800, uh, sorry, 1,800 in one year. Paul is passionate about the intersection of conscious business, social impact, and aware practices. I am so excited to be here today with you, Paul. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Kate, and congratulations on what you're doing with the, content, uh, with the podcast. It's awesome. Excellent. So Paul, tell me, what is it that lights you up? What inspires you to get out of bed in the morning? Oh my gosh, how many, uh, how much time do you have? We could be here all day just about that question, Kate. Um, three things. Number one, the people I love. My life is full of just, just remarkable humans, both on the personal and community level. I live in downtown Albuquerque. I've lived in New Mexico since 1993. The, the, the layers of amazing humans, whether it's my trail running buddies or my men's group or the, you know, working for positive impact locally, I'm just surrounded by amazing humans. The work I do, I work with people who very intentionally put values and positive impact at the very top of their priority list. And when that's who you're working with, um, it just attracts a certain amazing kind of human. And then nature, whether it's the garden in my backyard or, again, I live, people have heard of the Rocky Mountains, New Mexico, Albuquerque is at the very tail end of the Rocky Mountains and 15 minutes from my house, I'm at 10,000 foot plus mountains and get to spend a lot of time in nature. Wow, life sounds good, Paul. <laughs> life is so good. I mean, I'm sorry we're going through hard things as a planet, but my personal life is really good these days. I guess that's been one of the gifts of what's happening um, in the world at the moment is that we've all really just focused in on, you know, our local surroundings and the people that are so important to us in that. And so um, I'm hearing that a lot in, in interviews at the moment. So tell us a little bit about your journey, Paul, up to launching Awarepreneurs. Yeah, it's a fascinating. I like to joke that the universe tricked me into becoming a social entrepreneur. So it was, it's a little bit, there's a, in the uh, indigenous traditions in New Mexico, there's something called the coyote tradition, which is like the trickster. And it, it seems to be something that's been very active in my life. So I knew I wanted to help people. I didn't want to just go chasing money. I grew up in the suburbs of New York. If anybody knows who Martha Stewart is, she was 15 minutes down the road. It was very about how you looked and how much money you made and what kind of car you drove. And I knew from a young age, while I was grateful, we lived a good quality life. It was something that wasn't a fit for me. And I wanted to help people. So I went into community mental health. Like, how do you help people? You find people who are going through really hard situations and you roll up your sleeves and you go to work. So I did community organizing and had a master's degree in, in counseling and mental health and did that for 15 years. Fabulous opportunities to work in incredible communities like the... Uh, like a place called Taos Pueblo. Many people have heard of Taos, uh, the oldest continually inhabited building in North America. And we did things like helping bring restorative justice and other circle-based processes into communities that had experienced a lot of trauma and were trying to work with families getting in trouble and young people getting in trouble in more um, inclusive and less punitive ways, right? And it worked with engaging young men as fathers and uh, ending domestic violence and creating support for men so yeah, we could just be more active in our families. It was fabulous work, but it was really hard work. And after 15 years of it and starting a nonprofit and not only having to do the work, but think about the funding and being the executive director, I burnt out, you know, 
it was great work. I learned a lot, but I got compassion fatigue and I just couldn't continue. And I also by that time had a, had a, a daughter and being a dad, like being a social worker, kind of community mental health organizer person, you don't make a lot of money and being a broke social worker with a kid starting to get into your mid thirties and into hitting 40, it's like, wow, this is really not working. So I was um, living in rural New Mexico at the time across the horse pasture from a guy named Soren Gordhammer, who turned out to be the founder of Wisdom 2.0. And he also went through a divorce and his life fell apart, pretty similar to mine, some similar timing. And we got online, right? You're really passionate about social media. We go back in 2008 in rural New Mexico, nobody in New Mexico knew what Twitter was, but we got on Twitter and we started in conversations where people are looking at conscious business and using social media for positive impact. And suddenly we were connecting with people like Tony Shea, the founder of Zappos. And just through the power of meaningful dialogue, it was a smaller community then. And it turned out that Tony and people like him were really interested in conscious business principles. And there weren't that many people talking about it. And we weren't rock stars. We certainly did not have billion dollar a year businesses. I was literally at Zappos World Headquarters on the day they were handing out t-shirts, right? Here I am like trying to reinvent myself as a, you know, a, a, a community mental health guy, get invited to Zappos on the day they're handing out t-shirts to their employees saying, thank you for making us a billion dollar a year company. This was 2009 or 2010. Um, we went to Google and Google had a search inside yourself program, which was mindfulness and emotional intelligence, but they were playing their cards really close to their chest. They weren't telling a lot of people about it, but because we were on social media, they're like, you guys are talking about conscious business and come to Google and we're doing this thing. And we don't want to necessarily tell a lot of people, but come to Google. And like one opportunity after another started to open up and Soren decided to write a book and then create a conference called Wisdom 2.0 and asked me to come work for him. And like, I, suddenly I'm in Silicon Valley at Facebook and at Google and talking to LinkedIn and the chief technology officer at Twitter and all these incredible people who were building these technologies, but wanted, were very hungry for the conversation about what's the wise use of these technologies and that wasn't necessarily happening in their company culture. They were just trying to improve the product itself, but they're like, wow, this is really powerful stuff. What do we do with it? And Wisdom 2.0 took off. It was the right idea at the right time. And, and partially because I was just in the conversation with so many thought leaders, one thing led to another. And then, like I said, the universe kind of tricked me into becoming a business. I, I learned about how to use Twitter from the chief technology officer of Twitter. How would you use this to build community and enhance certain kind of conversations? And the chief engineer at Facebook. And like, it was an incredible opportunity. And I'm deeply grateful, Kate, that it just kind of came from what you're so passionate about being in conversation that's really true to your values and showing up on social media. It wasn't some like hashtag we used. It wasn't some paid Facebook ad strategy. It was really genuine, deep dialogue about something that we were passionate about and connecting with other people, particularly leaders in that movement in authentic ways. And the invitations and the referrals just kept coming. I am totally professionally crushing on you right now. <laughs> I, and it, you know what? So much of who I am today and the work that I do came from my first experience at Wisdom 2.0. And so I will thank you as probably the person that wrote the tweet that educated me about Wisdom 2.0. Uh, and that took me you there. You said you I, went 2012. I was literally, I worked at, at Wisdom 2.0 as a social yeah. media director from 2012 to 2014. So yes, I might have written that. Yeah. <laughs> and I literally, um, I can't tell you how excited I am by this conversation because I literally had been working in social media for probably three years by then and was still finding my feet and figuring out where my niche or niche, as you like to say in the US, always makes me feel itchy, that word, um, that, you know, where my where my place in, in the world was. And it was very new social media back then. But to yeah. actually, and I, you know, flew to the US and showed up at this conference, really not knowing what was going to happen there. And it completely transformed 
my life both personally and professionally. Um, and that was where I got this burning curiosity about the intersection between humanity and technology and how amazing these technologies can be to bring us all together. But also the willingness to explore the shadow side of that was really um, yeah you know, that was so important to me because everything then was social media and it was all flashy lights and how wonderful it was, but I could already really see some of the shadow side of that. So being in a place where uh, all these humans were coming together to discuss this was like being a kid in the candy store. And the two days that we had at Googleplex as part of that just literally blew my mind. Um, and again, was so transformational for me in, in my business and my and my personal life. And it's very much so, Kate. It was, it was a, just what led up to that and being in those conversations and who I met and what's happened since then. I, I left Wisdom 2 in 2014 and moved more in the direction of like more explicit social and impact entrepreneurs. That was my my training and my wheelhouse in New Mexico, and that's what I wanted to stay true to. I am grateful to Google and to Facebook and to Twitter, and that's not my wheelhouse. I, I want to use those tools, but helping those large organizations figure out that I want to help people who are really pushing, like we're in a really poignant moment on planet Earth in terms of some big, big, big issues, obviously with the pandemic, but I'm talking about things like, is life going to be inhabitable? You know, is this planet going to be inhabitable for our children and grandchildren? And if so, is it the kind of planet that we want to pass on to them kind of conversation with climate change and um, the racial reckoning that we've seen certainly here in the US and um, other countries as well, just massive inequalities that have been exposed by COVID, not just COVID itself, but who has access to good health care and, and vaccines and so many other issues. That's my wheelhouse. That's where I want to be working with who has the on the ground, helping everyday people at scale kind of solutions. And how can we use these technologies and um, yeah, so that's what I've focused on since uh, 2014, and that's what Awarepreneurs is all about. And so much of what I can bring to that conversation comes from my time in the Wisdom 2.0 community and being uh, invited to be a leader and a community organizer in that it was a laboratory. Um, we didn't exactly know how to do this either because like you said, so many of these tools were so new. We were trying things and talking to the people who were building them and rapidly iterating and wow, that really worked and oops, well, that didn't, let's not do that again, right? And so much of what I know how to do now came from my on the ground training and community organizing in New Mexico from incredible community organizers. And then the online version of that from these folks who were building these technologies who were, as you were saying, also very aware that these are very powerful tools that can be used for good, but they can also be used to manipulate and for harm. And they wanted to help us have those conversations. They kind of pulled back the curtain and said, here's how it works. And you might want to think about this. And what about trying that with the chief technology officer of Twitter and the chief engineer of Facebook? That was a pretty powerful laboratory. Let's just say yeah. that. What I love about what I'm hearing there, Paul, though, is that and it's such an important distinction to make, is it, it's human first. These are just tools, they're platforms, and they absolutely can help to amplify whatever a human is doing and to connect with others and build that community. But it sounds like what you're saying is with awarepreneurs, it's human first and technology. Uh, absolutely. Like, like, for instance, podcasting has become one of my favourite tech. I, I joke all the time. My name is Paul and I'm podcast obsessed. I, I really am podcast obsessed. And the reason is it's a very human focused. It's one of the more inclusive technologies. So for instance, if you have a device that in any way can get on the internet, like the simplest bandwidth, it's much less bandwidth than not say something like video. So if you live in a rural area or in a country 
even in, by U.S. standards, New Mexico is one of the more rural states. So our internet, like today, my internet for video was going in and out. Even though I live in downtown Albuquerque, there's only like 2.2 million in the entire state of, Albu of New Mexico. So we're not the top of the list for the best technology, shall we say, right? We're a rural state. And even in downtown Albuquerque today, my video on Zoom with my clients was going in and out. And it just kind of works that way. Even if you're a bank or have super high speed, being in a place like New York or San Francisco or London or Singapore, they just have better internet. So, so I have an affinity. I love that, that podcasting is so inclusive. As long as you can hear or the host does a transcript or some way you can take part in the conversation, there's any way you can get the drippiest, the slowest internet, you can participate in the conversation. And that that speaks to me. And we have listeners all over the world and members of our community come from all over the world because they hear us on the podcast and they want to join that conversation. That is so aligned with who I am and what I'm all about. And so what's the intent of the Awarepreneur podcast? The podcast, the way we talk about it, I'm, I'm a a huge fan of Venn diagrams. We just did a Awarepreneurs uh, masterclass before this, and I was joking and they were teasing me, our members, about my affinity for Venn diagrams. If anybody doesn't know what a Venn diagram is, it's circles that intersect and where the intersections happen, something really interesting. So we talk about the podcast as the intersection of conscious business, social impact, and awareness practices. And where those three meet, something very interesting to me and many other people is, um, is happening there. And, and I think those are some of the three most important or at least most powerful technologies or forces for good on the planet right now. Conscious business and people who are paying attention to positive impact in their communities and people who are leveraging the inner practices, you know, wisdom 2.0, whether it's meditation or yoga, or different kind of values clarification processes. Those inner technologies are thousands of years old. And I like to say, I love technology, but the most powerful technology on the planet is an optimized human nervous system. So those, oh, awareness, those awareness practices help us optimize our nervous system. So you bring an optimized, clarified in terms of values and who we are and the impact we want to have nervous system with a real clear sense of there's some there's a community suffering going on that I want to do something about, whether it's something to do with uh, high quality, clean food or women's empowerment or social entrepreneurship is one of my impact areas, obviously. And then how do we use the principles of very consciously designing a, a business that leverages, I want to have this impact and I want to make sure the humans are well cared for and bringing Oprah Winfrey has a sign on her set that says, please be aware of the energy you bring onto this set. She doesn't say only come to work if you're happy, but she says, please be aware of what you're bringing into, because it matters. The culture we create where we work has something to do about, does this business succeed and do we have the positive impact? You bring all that together and some pretty amazing things happen. So that's what we're trying to do with the podcast. And talk to me a bit about the community that sits around that and the work that you're doing. What impact is Awarepreneurs having in the world? Oh, I love our community. We have such awesome humans. I mean, it, humans are awesome in general, but these particular humans I, I love. Yeah, so we have a, a membership community. It's a very affordable. Some people pay a dollar. Some people pay $250 a month, depending on how much touch and what kind of master classes they want. So it's a it's an affordable membership community that we look at this intersection and really get into the nuance. We, we currently have about 290 members on four continents and we share, hey, um, it can be, will somebody take a look at my sales page? Um, our master class that we, we have a podcast success team. How do you leverage podcasting? to really move the needle on both the impact goals you have for your business and the revenue and in income um, goals you have for your business. We do a, we're do we doing a masterclass later this month, bringing more ease and grace to your marketing. 
people are really excited about that one. Like marketing can feel like such a grind or scary and oh my gosh, what if I say the wrong thing? Or like, oh my gosh, I have to turn on the video and see my face there at all. I don't know. And, you know, I don't know if this is an audio podcast or video on, but like, I'm not as young as I used to be. And, you know, all my hairs are gray now in my beard, right? And okay, if I have issues about that, there's that camera, it doesn't change. I'm still going to be gray. I'm only going to get grayer, right? All those issues are right there. And yet, my goal to make a positive impact in the world like all right let's let's find a way to be a little more graceful with whatever marketing channels i choose so we support each other in very granular as well as those self-care ways of like i remember the day that somebody said you know i'm a gay man i've been in a relationship i've been married for 18 years and last night i got to divorce. my partner told me i wanted to get divorced my husband told me i mean he wants to get divorced i'm absolutely crushed and i don't have a lot of savings and i need to get up and go to work what do i do and the outpouring of love and care and gentle loving grounded advice for somebody in a moment like that was just I, I'm still almost in tears thinking about it. That's what happens. Those are the real world. Like sometimes even in hard moments, we still need to keep the business afloat. And most of our members are micro businesses, one person, five person, 10 people, 15 people. We don't have a thousand person company that somebody can get a family leave very easily. Take six months off. Don't worry about it. Here's your salary. That's not most of our members' realities. So how do we balance the real, just real, real of running a business like this? That's what we do. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of the most beautiful things that I think these online technologies can provide is that connection that would never happen otherwise. Yeah. I was reading a Facebook post last night from a woman I met in 2012 at Wisdom 2.0 and we met at Googleplex. I, we literally ended up in a group together and didn't talk to each other after that, but we connected on Facebook. And I feel like she's one of my closest friends um, because she constantly is commenting about my kids and she's never met my children or has no idea what's going on in my life right now other than what I share on Facebook. But yeah. she posted last night that, you know, she's really struggling, that she's in the US and that she's really struggling at the moment with the isolation and she's had a whole lot of personal things that have collided with that. And she said, you know, this time of day is really hard for me. If anyone can reach out, I'd really appreciate it. And so we've set up a time for us to have mm. a Zoom call so that we can connect again. And none of that would happen if it wasn't for technology. She would have just been a woman I met in 2012 and never saw or heard from again. Remember that person I was in a group with? I wonder what yeah. happened to her. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's that human to human connection that would never happen otherwise. Um, I'm really interested interested in your reflections when you look at community and the role that technology plays, particularly given the insight you've had into some of these companies, what kind of strategies do you use to really build that community and connect people using technology? There, there's, there's kind of two layers as I hear you ask that question of awareness. One is how do you grow a community like that? And then how do you deepen or connect or, or build something that's not just a bunch of humans on some platform. Um, and those aren't the same question. I, I'd kind of tease that apart. Kate. So in terms of building, I think there's a lot of strategies, but one of the things that I learned at Wisdom 2, and Soren's very, very good, is thinking about really engaging the thought leaders as much as you're able to. So one of the reasons Wisdom 2.0 took off is Soren was very skillful about getting into conversation and, and the way we learned how to do it, and I still practice today, is finding, there's a, there's a wonderful um, coach here in the U.S. called Pam Slim, who's a business coach in uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona area, and she talks about finding the water holes. Like wisdom 2.0 has become a water hole. It's where people get like humans want to gather. We all need to drink water. We're going to go somewhere to get our water. And like, you know, the whole metaphor, the water cooler, like, you know, we're going to, there's stories, there's biblical stories and every other tradition about how community gathered around the water, right? We all have to drink. 
And so where are people already gathering and particularly who are the leaders in those water hole communities, right? And so Soren was really skillful about bringing leaders that had a, already existing communities like Eckhart Tolle or Marianne Williamson or John Kabat-Zinn, people who are already very well known in the wisdom space and the tech leaders, the co-founders of Twitter and very key leaders in Facebook and Jeff Wiener um, up until very recently, the CEO of LinkedIn. These are all folks who are very, very, very engaged in the wisdom 2.0 community. And they already had very dynamic a lot of people know what LinkedIn is. <laughs> if Jeff Wiener says, this is cool, you should go, you might notice that. And especially if Jeff Wiener, if you're in the tech space and, and the CEO of LinkedIn and the chief technology, no, the co-founder of Twitter and the chief uh, engineer of Facebook all say, go to this thing, you're going to at least take a look at that. If you're in the spiritual community and John Kabat-Zinn and Marian Williamson and Byron Katie and Eckhart Tolle and, and, and all say, go check this thing out you're probably going to go take a look. What's going on? Soren did that incredibly skillfully, right? So in any community, there's natural leaders that people are already looking to that um, can help move the needle in, in putting something as an important conversation on people's radar. And that's something I continue to do. It's something we do very much on the Awarepreneurs podcast. We're looking for people who have very interesting and willing to have conversations that are hard and many people are avoiding. And we're looking to balance that with people who have existing communities. One of our guests fairly recently has 800,000 followers on LinkedIn. If you do that through time, it's not the only criteria. And if you're skillful about if somebody has an interesting, if two people have an interesting topic they want to talk about, and one of them has two followers on LinkedIn and one has 800,000, you might want to consider the 800,000 person, right? They're called thought leaders or influencers, influencer marketing. That kind of an approach done organically and genuinely with an awareness that you're doing it to have positive impact. Right? I'm not doing it to make a gazillion dollars. There are people who do influencer marketing to make a gazillion dollars. I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it because I want to gather up the leaders because I really want to move the needle and help more social entrepreneurs make more money, hire more people, and get people out of working for companies that aren't aligned with their values. That's one of my, I can pull on that lever, move the needle, and make the world a better place by helping people work in companies or their own business where they feel aligned with what they're doing as opposed to hating, but they need a paycheck, so they go there and they do work that harms planets, harms communities, harms them, harms their family, but they need the paycheck, so they stay. So that's, that's one of the key things that I learned from that conversation. Find influencers, find people who are passionate about the topic, having hard conversations, and try to do it with thought leaders. That's just a very, it costs nothing. It costs intelligence, but it doesn't cost dollars. It costs time, but it doesn't cost dollars. I love that concept. I actually um, was on an interview just a couple of days ago with the leader of the world's largest octopus fan club. And the reason he set that up is that he believed that octopuses are really misrepresented and he wanted to focus on environmental sustainability and support of the octopus. And he literally leads the world's largest octopus Fan club. A, what was that movie? My octopus. My teacher? octopus teacher. Wasn't that? A, oh my god! Wasn't that an exquisite movie? Right? Who could ever? So think many of beautiful octopus? layers to that. Oh my gosh! Who could ever think of octopus without just a huge I know. smile? Well, and well, yeah, right. He oh. started his community well before that, and of yeah. course, that's amplified his, I you know, his mission yeah. as well. But it's what I love about because he talks a lot about, and they do interview with an octopus, and they interview the people in aquariums who are looking after the octopus and the octopus is part of so I love that um, really how can you connect with thought leaders in the space that you're working in and do you find that people are because I know for a lot of the people that I work with they would go oh they're never going to talk to me what are some of your strategies for kind of getting past that that feeling like someone might be too big or they're not going to be interested in right. engaging there's a couple conversations first of all again I'm a New York Jew originally, so I'm just going to say it like it is. I'm going to say, get over yourself. If you're if you're actually 
trying to have good, do business for good. If you're not having business for good intentions, go listen to somebody else. I don't want to help you. I'm here to help people who are doing business for good. If you're doing business for good, it's not about you. It's about the kind of impact you want to have on the world. So feel the feelings, notice them. And at some point, we got to get over ourselves because it's not about Paul Zelizer. It's about what kind of world are we going to leave our children? And part of the reason we're such a mess, at least in my worldview, is because so many people are working in organizations that are doing harm to the planet, harm to our communities, contributing to inequality. Now we have this whole other business movement where people are growing companies where that's not true. My job is to do everything I can to pour gas on the fire of businesses that are doing business for good. And it's not about Paul Zelizer, it's about that movement. So get over yourself, like feel the feelings and it's not about you, it's about, the, and if you don't have an issue area that you feel passionate enough about to inspire you to do the work, then take a look at what's going on there. Cause there's push factors and pull factors. For me, the pull of making a positive impact and contributing to a planet that I feel good about leaving. At least I can look my daughter in the eye. She knows what I do for work and I can look her in the eye and her generation, they're freaking out about what we're doing to our planet. And I can look them in the eye and her, her friends know what I do for work. Um, some of them work for my clients and our community members. I teach them how to do social media because my daughter started doing social media for my client when she was 13 years old. She knows what I do. I can look her in the eye and say, honey, I don't know how this is all going to go down, but I am doing everything I know how because I love you. I love this planet. I want the best. And I'm literally doing everything I know how. And so it's that's why I do what I do. It's not like, oh, my beard's gray or I'm a bald guy or have a big nose. All those are true, but that's not what this is about, right? It's about we are in a very poignant moment and I do what I do for a reason. And that's why. The other thing is the concept of scaffolding. If you're trying to do something with meditation, you don't have to try to get John Kabat-Zinn on your podcast, the very first podcast episode. Start with somebody who is knowledgeable, scaffold, right? Take a look at who are they. They're the most accessible thought leader that you can easily bring on and build up from there, right? So start where you can and then scaffold up to other layers of influence and leadership. And we all got to start somewhere. And none of us, I didn't start with a top 2% of the world podcast. I started with the first episode. I didn't even really know what I was doing. And I had a fabulous guest. She was totally awesome. We had a great interview that I still talk to. I still send people to. And I've, I'm a better host and I can get guests that are higher level of thought leadership and influence than I can, number one. And I look back on number one and I said, oh, wow, that was kind of awkward and sweet. And she was awesome. And I'm better than I was in the first episode. And thank God I started because I wouldn't be here where we are now if I didn't start somewhere. I love that. It is one of the quotes that I often remind myself of is never compare your insides to other people's outsides. And I think one of the things about social media is that, you know, some people, they make it look so easy. They make it look like they woke up one morning with 2 million followers and, you know, we all have a journey to get to where we are, which is, yeah, what I love unpacking in, in this podcast. So I diverted you away from the community strategy conversation by asking you another question. Oh, no, that's okay. Yes, yeah, so the number one is how do you build it? And I gave some, there's other tips we can do, use hashtags, there's all sorts of things, right? You can uh, look for where are people already gathering. So like podcast guest strategy, I think, if you're trying to grow something fairly quick, go find the podcasts uh, or other interview channels where people are already have large listenerships and go pitch them a fabulous topic. So even if you're fairly new, they still want to talk about it, right? I have a very popular podcast, but there are certain people who just pitch just the absolute right topic that our listeners want to hear. And they don't care that they're not rock stars. It's such a great topic that they want that I say yes anyway, right? So even a, a top podcast in the world or a top YouTube interview channel or top blog, it's called uh, guest blogging. So things like that, right? Try to get yourself into the conversation by providing value to leaders. Okay, great. Once you start having people, you're building momentum, you've got people in your community, your free Facebook group or your paid membership on whatever platform, you know, member press or whatever, right? Um, 
then there's a question, what do you do with them, <laughs> right? A lot of people are like, oh, I want to build community. Great. Okay, cool. So the, a couple of key strategies. First of all, if anybody's really interested in this, there is a fabulous community called CMX, right? It stands for Community Manager Exchange. It's free on Facebook. There's like 20,000 members, and it's a fabulous, fabulous, the largest community of community managers on planet Earth. They just came out with a, the David Spinks just came out with a new book. I think it's called The Power of Belonging. I have to get it. I haven't gotten it yet. Go buy the book and go join CMX Hub because it's all about people who are really professional. They're, they're like they understand the power of community and they really get into the strategies and the psychology of building communities online. So like just stop what you're doing, turn the podcast off and go join the Facebook group. And if you don't do anything else, you're going to be just fine. The other thing I'd say is, you know, um, it's about in helping people build the habit. So, so things that allow and invite people to contribute in ways that as a leader and as a community builder and manager and organizer online. So a classic way to do this, like with the Awarepreneurs, we do prompts, right? Every Monday is um, Share Your Intentions Monday. Every Tuesday, we post a podcast episode of the week and people come in and ask questions on that topic. Every Wednesday is Share Your Offerings. This is a community of entrepreneurs. We don't want people if hundreds of members, we don't have all these entrepreneurs saying, buy my thing, come join my group, come to, but every Wednesday we have a container where you can post any paid offering you want. Every Thursday is, we call it content love Thursday, your podcast episodes, your blogs, right? You see where I'm going with this. At least we have six days a week prompts. We have other things we do in our online community, but six days a week, we're specifically prompting people. And that way members have something to talk about that's aligned with what we're trying to do as a community, in our case, build our muscles as social entrepreneurs and help each other grow our impact and our income as social entrepreneurs. That's a really important one. I see a lot of people, either it feels like a ton of work because you're like scratching your head, like, how do I get people to engage today and trying to like all of that scheduled I use an app called social bee and it all you know automatically drops into the group I can add in addition to that here's a great article go check out this episode here's an opportunity of a conference here's a funding opportunity just for social entrepreneurs here's a great LinkedIn strategy for social all that stuff I do but six days a week there's something happening and people are like they have an opportunity to find their rhythms in the community as opposed to like, I don't know how to begin to even step into the dance here. Help them out, give them, give them something to work with. Yeah, we often talk about communities, you know it's a community rather than just a gathering of people in a Facebook group. Once the leaders can step out of the conversation and the conversation continues and there's a exactly. relationship that occurs between people and you know it's the biggest challenge for brands and businesses is how do they get their brand out of the middle of the conversation exactly and really create that that dialogue and that connection to, amongst just them. today one of our members like does anybody have any experience monetizing a youtube channel another member raised her hand said yep i do and they're talking and this is all happening while i'm working with clients right on how cool is that you two are awesome celebrate them give them some love and go back to working with clients or being on this podcast right I did some work with a, a large tech company a few years ago and we were setting up a Facebook group which was a support you know and ancillary to their customer support where you would ring up and stay on hold for however long before you got support remember those days we don't oh, really God, expect, we yeah. expect a lot more now I'm, don't a, we? I'm having trauma right <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, all those hours we wasted on hold for support oh my God. For different company. No, okay you're traumatizing us don't do that <laughs> but we launched this Facebook group and it went far better than anyone expected but I got a phone call about three months later from the head of customer support saying Kate I've just come out of a board meeting and you're not very popular and I you know your stomach sinks your heart races <laughs> I said oh Matt what's going on you know please tell me and he said we have a problem our community members are answering each other's questions before our staff have the opportunity <laughs> to answer the question. they're making our staff redundant <laughs> right <laughs> and I said I paused and I said oh that's a really interesting problem to have Matt <laughs> And how wonderful that their customers actually care enough about their brand and their product that they will support each other 
other around right. that. Right, how cool is that? And of course that? there's, you know, there's metrics you need to put around it to make sure it's safe and all those sorts of things. But it was an interesting conversation to have where they thought it was a really big problem that the community were helping each other out rather than them being able to be the center of the conversation. I want to say one other thing, since a lot of your listeners are entrepreneurs, I love that, Kate. And, and I'd even walk the needle, like, what's possible even past that is your customers or your community teaches you how to make a better product, make more money, and help more people. That's, like, over and above. Like, not just, I love what you're saying there, but I'll give you an example. One of the uh, really popular examples about community effectively when a business sets it up and invites it, I believe it was BMW. It was a car. It was either it was one of the German car uh, manufacturers, either BMW or Audi. Um, they created an online community for their car enthusiasts, like people who'd been buying those cars for like at least a decade, and they partnered them up with the engineers. And the enthusiasts actually taught the engineers the exact kinds of decisions about how to make the cars better. And those folks love the cars more. They turned from brand, like they, this is their brand, to like brand evangelists. And they like, it became one of the most successful marketing thing they ever did because the car got much more precise for this exact kind of person. They loved it more. They bought them more. Now these are expensive cars, right? But they also, and they went out and told their friends and say, oh, you know, everything you heard about Audis, well, this one's even better than that. Let's go drive one. And they just became brand advocates. So that's in a car thing that's not an impact brand. But let me give you an example. In our, in Awarepreneurs, we have this podcast success team. We have several dozen podcasters who are looking very specifically at how do you leverage podcasting to grow impact businesses, both the impact and also the revenue in these businesses fabulous little micro community inside of the larger awarepreneurs community. And that community is teaching me how to make that service better. They're doing it all the time, how we schedule it, what we call it, a very simple little thing right at the beginning, Paul, we would just go around and say your name and where you uh, called in from. No, Paul, we should say our name where you call in from and what's your podcast? Duh, I just didn't think about it. And each person got to talk like 10 or, but now they're introducing each other to guests because every time we meet, it's a podcast success team. Of course, we should talk about our, I just didn't think about it. They said, Paul, this will make it better. And every time I move the needle in the direction of listening to them, as long as its values align, they get more and more enthused and they keep going and getting their friends. And that podcast success team is growing with almost no marketing, surely on the incredible energy they're being listened to. They're, they're, we're, we're together making it better. I'm making more money. I'm, you know, uh, what I'm on the planet to do, which is to move the needle in terms of social entrepreneurship. I'm doing that not just with these folks, but they're going out and getting better at, at terms of being pod. They're, they're getting raving reviews. Their guests are like, this is the best podcast I've ever been on. How did you do that? This is episode number seven. And they're saying part of this podcast success team, right? <laughs> and they taught me everything I know, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So, so if you do this well and you're listening, not only will you experience the joy of having a vibrant community, but this will move the needle in terms of what you want to have happen in your business. And again, the CMX community, they're really on top of this and, and brands that are investing in, in, um, in community understand this isn't just a like, let's keep people happy and give them a nice little Facebook group so that they can like get some help without having to be on hold, which is great, but there are orders of magnitude, more opportunities for business owners who incorporate these kind of social technologies with an awareness that if you listen to people, they'll help you 10 X the quality of your product and then they'll go market it for you. That's not something I would ignore if I was somebody who wanted to grow a business. Absolutely. And it comes right back to that human first, doesn't it? It's putting your customer or your audience first. And if they help you to uh, grow and you actually listen and do what they want, they are your, your best advocates. You'll as be long as this value is aligned. Yeah. As long as it's aligned with your values and yeah, ab there's nothing I know how to do better than to do that. You'll be pleased to know I'm a, um, I'm a learning mentor with Facebook now for their com certified community manager 
uh, program. Yep. And they're looking at very much, um, you probably know already, but they're looking very much at how these large communities that have grown on Facebook, how they can help them transition into being more of an organization and actually looking at nice. their purposes. And it's it's a smart move for Facebook, but it's also great for those of us that work on amplifying impact and amplifying voices i think there's some totally. exciting things coming around facebook communities that will will help um those who've grown a community but don't really know what to do with it business wise congratulations for having that opportunity obviously people think you know something and i'd agree with them <laughs> oh i love it because community management is something and community building and activating and amplifying community is something i'm super passionate about and it's you know there's been so much focus in digital marketing around paid ads and funnels and whilst that's important uh -huh. for businesses it's usually at the expense of true community and i think there's now the fact that there's a spotlight and you know you talk about the cmx hub the fact that there's a real spotlight now on community management community engagement and how to grow and activate those communities super exciting so um, exciting. and so i'm very passionate about helping people increase their capacity you know their skill set in that space because it's, um, you know, what better way to amplify impact or amplify an important message or cause or purpose? Totally agree. So, Paul, I feel like we could speak for days. <laughs> always, always an indication of a great, great podcast interview. Um, final question. What is one thing that you wish people would do differently? The, the main thing that comes to mind, Kate, is to be more intentional about the values and the purpose of their business. If we're, if we're talking about entrepreneurship and using social media to grow something, for-profit, non-profit, I don't know, organization, right? To really sink in with the, I call it your why, right? Your core values, your impact or vision statement, right? What, what are we doing this for? so much of wisdom 2.0 what i learned there is yeah we just because you can build it doesn't mean that it's a good thing for humanity or a corner of humanity or the planet or young people like for instance social media we now know we have really strong research that the more time young people are on social media the more anxiety depression and suicidality they're likely to be dealing with right just because we can build it doesn't mean we should build it what are we doing things for right and what are the values and how do we bake that into the dna of why we're starting a community why we're starting a business why we're starting an organization why we're starting a facebook group right that there is this we start with that very clear these are our values this is the impact we want to have whatever it is answer that first i see so many people the the cart before the horse they start a thing and it get it just gets into when there aren't those kind of collective boundaries or collective intentional levels we get into some horrific situations including our young people killing themselves and all sorts of horrible things because we're not doing the hard work of what am I doing this for? And at least to the best of my ability, when I or we are starting the thing, whatever the thing is, here's the reason why, and that's going to guide us as opposed to just starting it because we can, or from ego, or from single bottom line profit. Oh, I just want to grab a bunch of money over and over and over again. I see harm being done when things don't have a clear set of values and impact driving and i wish that that would just be wiped off the face of the earth like this thing was started for this reason we're going to do our best to follow these values if we get off track we're all human we're going to come back to those values and revisit it and reorient ourselves we're all going to make mistakes but when we don't have those conversations humans do a lot of harm a lot of harm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great way to finish off, bring us back to what's most important. 
Thank you so much, Paul, for being here today. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, how can people find you? We'll include all of the amazing links you've talked about in the podcast today. We'll include those in the show notes, but where would you like people to go to find you? I'm not that hard to find. There aren't too many Paul Zellers on the planet, but the easiest place is just go listen to the Awarepreneurs podcast. Go check it out. Join the conversation. And if you like what you hear, come find us. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today, Paul. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Kate. And again, congratulations with what you built. Thank you for joining us on the Social Lights podcast produced by Social Mediology. You can connect with us on Facebook at Social Lights Podcast, and you can find today's show notes and more episodes at socialmediology.com.au forward slash social lights. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast platform to receive future episodes and share with your tribe to inspire others to action.